Chapter 3 of The Mystery of the Chinese Ring by Andy Adams Under Chinese Eyes You said two men, Biff repeated. I just bet you that one of them was the joker who paid me a visit this morning. You had a visitor early this morning? Ling Tang asked. I'll say I did. Not a visitor, though. A spy, maybe, sneaking around the yard and... Hold it, Biff, his father interrupted. Why don't you show Mr. Ling what the intruder brought you? Brought me, Biff muttered to himself as he opened the safety catch of his keychain. Some way to bring anything to someone. He removed the ring from a tangle of keys to his footlocker, his suitcase, a secret box, and to several things he had long since forgotten about. Taking the ring by the thick circle of gold, he held it out to the Chinese gentleman. Ling took the ring in his thin hands. He looked at it carefully. A beautiful piece of jade, he murmured. Bringing the ring closer to his eyes, he took a loop, a jeweler's magnifying glass, from his pocket to inspect the ring more minutely. While he did this, Biff filled him in on how the ring had been delivered. Exquisitely carved, Tang said, removing the loop from his eye. What's carved on it? Biff asked. It's the Chinese character which, roughly, would stand for the capital letter K. Does that have any significance for you, Tang? Mr. Brewster asked. Indeed it does. This is the ring of the great house of Kwang. Before the communists took over, it was one of the richest and strongest houses in all China. The ring was worn by the great lord of the house and by his sons, the young lords. It's funny I should get one of them, Biff said, laughing. I'm no young lord. Ling Tang smiled. Most mysterious, true, he agreed. And if they wanted to give me a ring, why didn't they just send it to me instead of throwing it through my window and ruining the screen? You did receive it in a most dramatic fashion. You can bet all the tea in China I did, Biff said. Perhaps, young man, Ling said, you received it as you did, so that he who presented it to you could keep his identity a secret. Even more important, Ling paused to drive home his point, he did it to keep you from seeing what he looked like. Biff and his father exchanged concerned glances. Were you acquainted with the house of Quang? Did you know its master? Mr. Brewster asked. It is an old, old family, once strong, once rich. An expression of sadness passed fleetingly across Tang's face. Until the Reds moved in and made ruthless changes, the house of Quang lived in the same age-old feudal manner as had the founder of the family generations ago. They had rich farmlands and houses of many courts. In the old lord's house, he who was called the Ancient One, there were more than a hundred courts. In America you would call them apartments or suites. Each court had its sleeping room, a room for eating, and a room beautifully decorated with a small fish pond in its centre, where the lords of the house would go to think and meditate and honour the memories of their fathers and their fathers' fathers. And this no longer exists? Mr. Brewster asked his friend. Gone, all gone. The farmlands divided up into small communes, the mines, the grain storage house snatched away. But the family still clings together. They still resist. Many of them are in hiding from local red officials. The earthly possessions of the House of Quang have been torn from them, but their family is still a proud one. They aid one another, even to helping the older members escape into the free world. Thomas Brewster had been doing some heavy thinking. Tang, he said, tell me this. In what part of China was the House of Quang located? In the province of Yunnan, south and somewhat west of Cumming, the capital of the province. Mr. Brewster was creating the map of China in his mind's eye. That would be near the border of Burma. Ling Tang nodded his head gravely. Not far from Yumheo, on the Irrawaddy River, Bill's father inquired. Your memory of China is excellent, my friend. Once the old lord, Teo Quang, made annual pilgrimages to Rangoon to visit the shrine of the Guatama Buddha, the magnificent pagoda of Shui Dagon. 
Biff was beginning to put the pieces together. I still don't get it loud and clear, but Uncle Charlie's located at Uhea. That's where I'm going, and Uncle Charlie's in Rangoon a lot, isn't he? Yes, Biff, he is. But the ring, why would somebody want me to have it? Do you suppose they want me to take it with me? That, my boy, is the question we'd all like to have the answer to, Mr. Brewster replied. Gosh, maybe I shouldn't take the ring with me. Tang spoke up quickly. Oh, but I think you should. Its manner of delivery hints of peril, but its message speaks of fortune and safety. Biff took the ring back. As he did so, a young, smiling Chinese entered the store hurriedly. So sorry, revered elder cousin, so sorry to be late. I change quickly and take over my duties. Tang smiled as the young Chinese hurried to the rear of the store. Biff had noticed the young man was wearing jeans and a sweatshirt. On the front of the shirt was the letter K. Biff turned and looked sharply after him. Who was that, sir? Biff inquired of Ling Tang. My young cousin, one of them, Tang said. He works afternoons for the Kirby Ice Cream Company. He is much enthused about your game of softball. He is of the team called the Kirby Coolers. Well, thanks for your information, Tang. Guess we'd better get going, Mr. Brewster said. I'll say hello to Uncle Charlie for you, Mr. Ling, Biff said. That will be most kind of you, the Chinese replied. Both bowed to Ling Tang, and he returned their gesture with a deep bow of his own. Biff and his father were thoughtful as they walked to their parked car. Something was building. No doubt about that. But what? What was the answer to, or the connection between the spying stranger at the ring and Biff's coming to visit his Uncle Charlie? The answer to those questions were not to be found that day. At home, Mrs. Brewster's first question was, Biff, who ruined the screen in your room? Biff looked helplessly at his father, who merely shrugged his shoulders. A rock, mother, this morning early, fooling around. I thought, young man, you were old enough to know better than to toss rocks around carelessly. Biff heaved a sigh of relief. He was going to get out of this easily. Neither he nor his father wanted to tell Mrs. Brewster the real reason for the hole in the screen. They didn't want to worry her. Now, Mrs. Brewster said briskly, we've lots to do today. We'll have no time in the morning. We'll have to leave for the airport early. Now here's what I want you to do, Biff. On the morning of his departure, Biff again woke early. He could hear noises throughout the house and sniffed at the friendly smells of breakfast being prepared. Everybody was up. They were all going with him to the airport. Biff looked at his watch. It was nearly seven by the time he was dressed. In one hour and fifteen minutes, he would be airborne on his way to Chicago the first leg in a journey that would take him halfway round the world. Breakfast was a funny kind of a meal that morning, not the food, but the way the whole family acted. The twins, of course, kept up a steady, excited chatter. Any trip to the airport made them bubble like a bottle of pop. But Biff and his mother and father either all tried to talk at the same time or suddenly remain silent at the same time. Biff gets all the breaks, Ted complained. Don't see why I can't go too. Because you're too young, that's why, retorted his twin sister, Monica. You're just eleven. You are too, the younger boy shot back. Way you act, anybody think you were older than me. Your time will come, Ted, Mr. Brewster said, acting as a peacemaker between his youngest children. When you're five years older, like Biff, the world will still be here. There'll be plenty of chances for you to spread your wings and fly. Right, said Ted emphatically, and I'll go by rocket. But what about me? I'm a girl, Monica wailed. Yes, Tom, answer that one, Martha Brewster said with a laugh. Don't worry, Monica, she continued. We women will show these men a thing or two. Like what? the girl said, pouting. Like how fast you can get ready, right now. We have to leave for the airport. As they drove into the busy terminal, Biff felt a lump in the pit of his stomach. First signs of homesickness, he thought. It had happened before. Biff always felt homesick at these last moments. But once he was underway, the feeling left him, except sometimes late at night, just before he fell asleep. 
This time, though, it was different. This was the first time Biff was going to be all on his own. Before, his adventures had been shared with his father. True, he'd been with his Uncle Charlie, but as nice a guy as Uncle Charlie was, uncles weren't the same as fathers. Biff checked in and had his ticket cleared. At the gate, he ruffled his brother's hair, gave him a quick hug and turned to Monica. He lifted her off her feet and planted a big smack on her plump cheek. Unashamedly, he embraced his mother in front of the crowded gate, then turned to his father. The two shook hands and Mr. Bruce had placed a hand on Biff's shoulder. You have the ring in a safe place, he asked softly. Biff nodded his head and touched his side trouser pocket. He had fastened the key chain to a longer, stronger chain, which was attached to his belt loop. I wouldn't display it, Biff. Biff nodded. He felt tears coming to his eyes, but he was through the gate and up the plane's loading platform before anyone could see them. Moments later, the plane was taxiing out to the runway for the takeoff. Biff, looking through the window, could see his family waving. After the plane's four engines had been warmed up and tested, the giant airliner lurched forward and in seconds was airborne. First stop Chicago, changed to a jet liner for San Francisco. Next stop Hawaii, then Tokyo, Hong Kong and finally Rangoon. Biff unfastened his seatbelt when the lighted sign snapped off and looked about him. The plane was only half filled. He glanced to the rear and his heart started pounding. Seated in the last seat on the plane's starboard side were two Chinese. They returned Biff's stare without expression. One of them, Biff noticed, seemed to have but one good eye. The other eye was nothing but a thin slit. Chapter 4 A Fortune Cookie Biff's connections at Chicago with the jetliner for San Francisco went without a hitch. In less than an hour, the sleek, silvery plane was in the air, circling over the bustling city of Chicago. It pointed its slender nose westward and began to race with the sun to the Pacific Ocean. The liner seemed to hang motionless over the broad plains of the west. Even the towering peaks of the Rocky Mountains passed backward beneath the plane slowly, as if the plane were barely moving, instead of slicing through the air at nearly 700 miles per hour. Once they were in the air, Biff, as casually as he could, had let his eyes sweep the length of the plane, trying to see if the two Chinese were still with him. There were no Orientals on this flight. By the early afternoon, the plane had left the mountains behind it and was starting its long glide to lose altitude as it neared San Francisco. Far ahead, Biff could see the blue waters of the Pacific sparkling under the rays of the sun, now standing high in the sky. Before he realized it, the plane was circling over San Francisco Bay. Biff saw the beautiful Golden Gate Bridge arching gracefully over the harbor. After a two-hour layover, during which time Biff's papers and baggage were cleared by customs, the boy boarded the plane which was to take him to his final destination, Burma. The sun had a good lead on the plane by the time the huge airliner took off, it would soon disappear over the horizon and darkness would greet the touchdown in Honolulu. Once the plane was over the water, Biff turned in his seat for a final glance at his homeland. He could just see the hills of San Francisco fading rapidly behind him. As he turned more towards the front, his eye was caught by two Chinese passengers. Biff looked at them closely. They were dressed in long flowing robes. The robes were brightly coloured in greens and reds and were gold-trimmed. Their wearers had tight skull caps worn low on their foreheads, and each wore heavy dark sunglasses. Could they be the same two who had been on the plane with him from Indianapolis to Chicago? For a closer look, Biff walked to the rear of the plane for a drink of water. He stood just in back of the pair and inspected the men closely. They could be the same men, he decided, but he couldn't be sure. It was difficult for him to tell one Chinese from another, and the change, if these were the same two, from American clothes to Oriental, made such a difference that it was impossible for Biff to be certain. Biff decided on a bold move. He stopped at the seat where the two Orientals sat impassively, staring straight ahead. I'm going to Rangoon, he said, a friendly smile breaking out on his face. 
to a place very near the Chinese border. Are you going to Rangoon or Hong Kong? There was no answer. Don't you speak English? Biff asked. I'm afraid they don't, a voice said behind him. Biff whirled. It was the stewardess. Can I help you? she asked. No, Biff said lamely. I was just, uh, just going to get a glass of water. The stewardess moved on, Biff down the glass of water which he didn't need, and started back to his seat. As he came to the side where the Chinese were sitting, he decided to try a little trick. He bent towards the floor of the plane. Is that your glasses case on the floor? he asked. The Chinese in the outside seat bent forward, his hand reached down, feeling by his feet. Then quickly realising he had given himself away, he sat up straight and stared ahead. A big smile of satisfaction decorated Biff's face as he settled himself in his seat. He knew one thing about them at least, they understood English, but good, and they could have taken another airline from Chicago to San Francisco. Biff's swift flight was without further incident as the plane sped across the Pacific. Then he was on the last leg, the flight from Hong Kong to Rangoon. It was the middle of the afternoon, an hour after the takeoff from Hong Kong. Rangoon was still nearly three hours away. The stewardesses were serving tea. With it they served almond cookies, and, as a favour from the airlines, each passenger received a fortune cookie, a small, delicate piece of folded, crisply cooked dough. Inside each fortune cookie was a narrow ribbon of paper, on which was printed a short saying, usually humorous. Biff remembered them from the Chinese restaurant he went to with the family every so often back in Indianapolis. He smiled as he remembered one he had once gotten. It read, Man who count chicken before they hatch is egghead. Biff finished his tea. He reached for the fortune cookie. Just as he did so, someone lurched against his shoulder, upsetting the tray. Cup, saucer and fortune cookie fell to the floor. Both Biff and the awkward passenger reached to pick up the scrambled tray. Biff's eyes met his helpers. It was one of the two Chinese. There was no reason for him to have stumbled. The plane was flying smoothly. It appeared to Biff that the shoulder bumping had been intentional. So, sorry, the Chinese said. His dark glasses glinted as he straightened up. Too bad, fortune cookie smashed to bits, but slipper paper still okay. Smiling briefly, he handed Biff the slender slip of tissue paper and made his way hurriedly forward. Biff watched him go, still puzzled by the man's actions. The boy smoothed out the slip. It had only a Chinese character scrawled on it. Through the Chinese printing had been drawn a red X. Now what the dickens is this, Biff thought. He started to crumble the paper but something about it held his attention. There was something familiar about it. Then he had it. Carefully he took out his keychain. He bent low and compared the character on the cookie slip with that on the surface of the ring's green stone. They were identical. The letter K, the seal of the lords of the house of Quang. Was this a warning of some kind? Did the red X cancel out the protection and good fortune the ring was supposed to ensure? But why? Why? Biff's brain kept signalling that one word with its question mark. The plane climbed over the coastal mountains of Vietnam, dropped down to skim over the rice fields of Thailand, then swung out over the Bay of Bengal for its approach to Rangoon. As the plane banked, Biff could see the many mouths of the Irrawaddy River spread out like long fingers from the broad brown arm of the river itself. The plane came low over the bay on its approach to the city and Biff could see the colourful sails of the Dows, the native craft which dotted the harbour. Some of the sails were bright red, some dirty brown. Many wore patches of every colour of the rainbow. The plane followed the course of the Huang River, 21 miles inland to the city of Rangoon. Standing out against the low white buildings, Biff saw the pagoda of Shui Dagon, rising nearly 400 feet skyward. 
It was entirely covered with gold leaf, which glistened in the setting sun. Then he remembered. Ling Lang had told him this was the important shrine of Buddha where the head of the house of Quang used to worship. Biff stretched and twisted. In spite of the cookie accident and the red X, he smiled. Almost there at last, he said to the passing stewardess. The long trip had been pleasant enough, but being confined to a plane for three days and three nights had become monotonous. Just as soon as he could, Biff bounded down the ramp from the airliner and ran eagerly to the entrance of the airport terminal. Through the portal into the terminal, Biff was caught up in a swirling mass of figures. Fat merchants, skinny students, long-robed mandarins, ragged beggars and men in the uniforms of all the world's military forces milled about the huge room. Biff searched the crowds trying to spot his Uncle Charlie. He was nowhere to be seen. Worried minutes followed. Then Biff saw a tall, very thin Oriental wearing a long, straight, white robe approach. The man came up to Biff. With hands clasped to his chest, he bowed low. Sahib Brewster? he asked. I'm Biff Brewster, the boy answered, thinking, gee, I'm a Sahib. I come from Sahib Charles Keene. He had planned to meet you. However, an emergency arose, and he had to fly to the north. But he should be back at Uheo by the time we get there. Oh, Biff was slightly shaken by this unexpected turn of events. And how do we get there, then? It is all arranged. Another pilot was dispatched to pick you up when your uncle was unable to come himself. Come, if you will follow me, even now the plane is ready. The Oriental turned, and a path in the human mass seemed to open for him. Biff followed, still not sure of this man. Hey, he called, wait a minute. The Oriental paused and turned to the boy. I'd like to know your name, Biff said. I don't like calling people just, hey. The Oriental's puzzled expression changed to a slight smile as understanding of Biff's hey came to him. I am called Nam Palung, head of the servants in your uncle's house. Okay, Nam, but what about getting through customs? That is all arranged. Your uncle is a man of much importance and influence. Come, we must hurry before darkness spreads its mantle upon the land. Biff didn't like being rushed like this. Yeah, but what about my luggage, my suitcase and trunk? Even now they precede us to the plane. All is cared for. The whole business seemed a bit cockeyed to Biff, but then shrugging his shoulders, he followed Nam to the northern exit of the terminal. Nam walked quickly, his far short steps limited by the skirt of his robe. Even so, Biff had to step up his pace to stay with the man. Suspicion again came to Biff as they left the terminal building and appeared to be taking a direction away from the airport. Look, Nam, just where are we going? The airstrips are back that way. Those, Sahib Brewster, Nam replied, are for the commercial airlines' planes. Private planes, such as those used by Explorations Unlimited, use a different part of the field. Biff's suspicions dropped a degree. Nam's explanation made sense. His suspicions dropped still further when Nam reached a jeep and with a low bow indicated that Biff was to get in. An American jeep, Biff thought. They're found everywhere. The small vehicle represented home and safety to Biff. He hopped aboard and Nam took his place behind the wheel. Biff looked across the airport where a mile away several small planes were clustered. He figured that was where they were heading. He heard a rustling behind him and turned abruptly. In the jeep's rear seat now sat, as if they had appeared out of thin air, two more Orientals. Both were dressed like Nam, but as Biff looked at them more closely he noticed that each man's hand was partly thrust into a fold of his robe, and each hand clasped the hilt of a slender dagger. Biff turned to Nam, alarmed. Who are those men with knives? His voice shook in spite of his attempt to control it. Nam interrupted. His manner was no longer courteous, his voice no longer smooth. His reply was stem and harsh. You will remain silent. Any outcry, any attempt to escape, 
and my men have been told to use those knives.' 